class is in memory of Jared Orchen, and we will start the last parsha of the Torah, the Zot Abracha, on page 425. This is the parsha that we actually read on Simcha's Torah, and with this we complete the Torah. Zot Abracha means this is the blessing, this is the blessing that Moses was blessing the Jewish people before he departed, on the day of his death. Let's read from inside and get into it. And this is the blessing that Moshe, the man of God, blessed B'nai Israel before his death. He said, Adonai, come from Sinai, radiated forth to them from Seir, appeared from Mount Paran. He came with a part of the sacred myriads for his high, his right hand, the flaming Torah law. We'll stop right here. One word is not understood. This is poetry. We'll go back, turn back to page 425. Hashem came from Sinai. Tell me, Hashem came from Sinai or came to Sinai? What is this? Hashem came to Sinai. What's this language? Hashem is Sinai Bo. Came from Sinai. Look the Rashi. Came from Sinai. This Rashi only. What does this mean? You want to read the Rashi? He went forward towards them. When they came to station themselves at the foot of the mountain, like a bridegroom going forward to receive his bride, as it is said, toward God. This teaches that he went forward towards them. Rashi says there's something amazing here, even if you don't realize that. When the Jewish people and at Mount Sinai and Shavuos, and God gave the Torah, it's written <coughs> that Hashem was there, and the Jewish people were still sleeping in the pajamas, right? There was no pajamas at that time, but they were in the camp. And Moses had to slip them out. Get up! Hashem is at Sinai! And what really happened? Hashem came first, and he was waiting for the Jewish people. I think Rabbi Shmuel or Rabbi Akiva says it. It was like a chosen, like a groom, who is waiting under the chuppe for his bride. Hashem, the groom, was waiting for the Jewish people, is the bride. They should come to whom? To the wedding. The chuppah was at Mount Sinai. An amazing thought. Suddenly the all giving of the Torah is not, you're taking it or else. It was a wedding, it was a love affair. It was a marriage. God came to Sinai waiting for the bride of the Jewish people. And as usual, the bride was still busy preparing herself. She didn't have... And he was waiting under the chuppah. That's what he says, Hashem is Sinai Bo. God came from Sinai. Then he says, and continue the Rashi in the bottom of the page, radiated for, forth from, uh, to them from Seir. What is Seir mean? What kind of a Seir? Who is Seir? What is Seir doing? Go ahead. As he had made an overture to the children of Asaph to accept the Torah, but they refused. The, the Medrash said that God before Mount Sinai, before he gave the Torah to the Jews, the way the Medrash put it, he went to every other nation and he offered them the Torah. And they didn't want to do it, to take it. What means he offered them? Hashem knew that the children of Esau will not be ready to accept the law, do not kill. And the children of Ishmael will not be ready to do the law, do not steal, or not commit adultery. Who are the only ones who are ready to take it? The Jewish people. They just touch how much it cost. For free, give us two. That's why we have to come with two tablets. <laughs> that, that's what he says here. And, and, and the Medrash learns it from these lines. He went to say, what did he went to say? What was he looking to say? Then from Mount Paran, continue the Rashi. Uh, from Mount Paran, where he went to make an overture to the children of Ishmael to accept it. But they refused. They refused also. The children of Ishmael didn't want, means the children of Ishmael means, means uh, the Arabs in general. The children, the children of Esau means the Christians in general. It's a very general statement, but in general. Basically, the rest of the world did not want to receive the Ten Commandments. The Jews said, we will do, and we will listen. They didn't even ask what's written there. If Hashem gives us something, we'll take it. Is this kind of a literal interpretation by Rashi, or is this more of a Midrashic interpretation? It's more of a Midrashic interpretation, but there is no other way to understand what's written there. Understand it's like, what's going on here? He came from Seir, he showed that from Paran. For sure you can find other interpretations, but that's the interpretation that <coughs> goes with the whole message. 
<laughs> so then he the, says, the children ahead. of Israel, gen, uh, excuse me, the children of Esau then generalizes to the Europeans? Is yes. Is that right, as opposed to the Edomites? Ex no, the Edomites. Say. The Edomites are the children of Esau. Yeah. The Edomites, absolutely. Right. And who is the Edomites today? Uh, well, I've been a while since I've met an Edomite. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying, it's the same thing. But, no, no, I mean, so that, that is... The, the Edomites are Esau, and so the Ishmael... The, so that's the understanding. Yes, yes. We're putting understanding the, the Romans. Europe, yeah. The Europeans are descended from the Romans. The Romans, the Romans yeah. are Edom. And, and then Christians. The Edomites are Romans. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it goes and the Christians Adam to Rome. Yeah, the Adam to Rome and Rome to Christians. Very good, okay. right. Okay. Yes. That explains something interesting. Why we don't see too many... Muslims, too many Arabs to convert to Judaism. We see over the generations thousands of Christians converting to Judaism. Because Esau was from a Jewish mother and a Jewish father. Where Ishmael was just from a Jewish father, not from a Jewish mother, so to speak. Therefore, the Esau children are constantly seeking towards Judaism more than the Ishmaelites. That's why it happens more. That's one of the explanations you really see an Arab who is converting to Judaism. Really. Throughout history. Very little. Very real. We are Christians was since the Romans' times, in the thousands. Okay. And then he says, from his right and the flaming Torah law. What is the flaming Torah law? Let's see the last Rashi. Mark, you want to read? <clears throat> Which was inscribed before him in the remote past in black flame on white flame. He gave them in the tablets inscribed by his right hand. Basically, all the other interpretation that the Torah was given from fire. The Torah is compared to fire. Like fire cannot be impurified by anything, cannot be defiled. So the Torah can never be defiled. No matter who learns the Torah, the Torah will not be defiled. The Torah will elevate them. You cannot defile the Torah. The Torah is an unbelievable power that it can, it's the wisdom of God and nobody can can make it not kosher, so to speak. Okay, we'll continue on page 427. He also cherished... He also cherished, cherished the nations. All of their sacred ones are in your keeping, for they were gathered in at your feet and accepted the burden of your word. The Torah which Moshe commanded us is the heritage of the congregation Oh, yeah. Okay, we'll stop right here. This line is a very important line. Every child knows this in preschool. We sing it. Torah, 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 Tziva, Lan, Moshe, right? Mm -hmm. Why we teach it to everyone? Every child. Why is it in preschool? Why is this verse in preschools? I have my, many more nice words from the Torah I can put in the preschool. Why every little child knows this line? Torah, Tziva, Lan, Moshe, the Torah was, that Moses commanded to us is an heritage to the congregation of Jacob. It's everybody's, children, oh. adults. What's an heritage? To inherit something, you don't have to deserve, you don't have to be qualified. The moment you are born to these parents, the child of Bill Gates, for example, the moment he was born to Bill Gates, all the estate of Bill Gates belongs to him automatically. He doesn't need that. He doesn't need to be, he, he, he can be, I don't know what. doesn't make a difference. He doesn't have to need any qualification. It just has to be born. A Jewish child is born, the whole Torah belongs to him. And it belongs to him as much as belongs to Moses, as much as belongs to the greatest rabbi. The Torah, he has the same level of ownership of the Torah that every Jew has. And that's what we engrave in the souls of little children. <coughs> you should know the Torah that God, that Moses gave us, belongs to you, is your inheritance. It's your estate as much as anybody else. Don't think that anybody has more rights and more ownership to the Torah than you. And that's why it's such an important line. That's what he's saying. And then he continues at number five. And you want to read? There was a king of Yerushalayim at the gathering of the county, the tribes of Israel together. Okay, what does he say? There was a king in Yeshurun. You know the temple Bnei Yeshurun? Mm -hmm. The word Yeshurun comes from here. What's Yeshurun means? Straight. Yeshurun is another name for the Jewish people. And you're right, Yeshurun means comes the word Yasham, straight. And because we are the children of the Yeshorim. The Yeshorim means the straight ones. Who are the straight ones? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob walked in the ways of God, in the straight path of God. 
The Jewish people are called Yeshurun too. Yeshurun is actually a higher name, so to speak. Sort of like Israel? It, it compared to Jacob, is that true? I think compared to Jacob, yeah. But uh, Israel, I don't know if it's... No, More I like think righteousness, really? Yeshurun, no, Yeshurun is a lower name than Israel. Israel stands for the word Li Rosh, the head of the Jewish people. Right. Yeshua means to, I think, walking. Walking is more, represents the legs, the foot, foot of, the, of the Jewish people. Yeah, so you have three names here. I mean, just on this page, you have the congregation of Yaakov, you have the tribes right. of Israel. And you have Yeshua. Yeshua. Yes, 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 so, yes. So each of them uh, is used in a different context then? I Yeshua mean, is used very little. Very right. little. But it's there, right. but it's used very right. little. Frequently you see the children, you know, the kind of, you know, Yaakov, Israel, so it's unclear. I mean, they're both Yaakov the same, and Israel same in person. general. No, 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 yeah. But Yaakov and Israel, yeah, it's a big difference. Yaakov comes in the word Ekev. Yeah. Ekev yeah. means the ill. Yeah. Israel comes in the word Rosh, the head. That whenever you see many times when Jacob was killed, he's written the name Yaakov. When he's more strong, it's written Israel. You can almost detect Whenever we are called Yaakov, al tirav di Yaakov, do not fear my servant Jacob. Do not fear Jacob. But, but when, it's, when it's talking about being strong, it's Israel. And you see in the, in, in the, in the book of uh, Genesis especially, you can, as I said, almost detect where, where the mood is going. Whoever is Jacob means a lower level. On Shabbos we are called Israel. During the week we are Jacob. On Shabbat, we are on a higher level. We are Lee Rosh, we are, we are connected to God. During the week, we have to be busy with mundane things. We are Jacobs. We are here. We are in the bottom. The spirituality is not high. Then you can see it in men. It's a known thing in Kabbalah and Siddha. It's full of it. Yeah, about Jacob and Israel. Yeshurun is more like Jacob. Okay, number six. Now he starts to speak specifically and the tribes. Every tribe is trying to give him a blessing. Go ahead. May Reuben live and let him not die. And may his constituency be counted. Oy vey. May Reuben live and, not, and let him not, be, not die. This is written, when Moses said it, 200 years after Reuben died. Approximately. <laughs> right? They left Egypt 210 years after they came in. Reuben, let's say, whatever, it's 200 years basically. What is Reuven? May Reuven live and not die. Tashi says something very interesting. May Reuven live, in the bottom of page 429. In this world, let mm -hmm. him not die in the world to come. Okay, what does this mean? Let's go on the bottom, bottom of this page. Number 32, there is a little note there. May the tribe of Reuven... No, that's not what... Uh, um, it's the page. Yeah, 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 no, read this. It is, read, it no, is. Read, uh, read 32. May the tribe of Reuven survive as an entity forever and not be decimated because of his grave transgression with Bila and Yaakov's subsequent curse. What happened? You know the story. When, Ro when Rachel died, Jacob had four, four wives. Everyone had a tent. But Jacob's bed but is in the tent of Rachel. That was his main house. She was the main house. Rachel. Rachel died. Jacob took the bed and moved it to Bila, to, to Rachel's maidservant's tent. Reuven, who was the oldest son of Leah, said to himself, not enough that, my ma that Rachel was a, disturb a, a, a competition to my mother. No, that's I can handle. But Bila should be a competition to my mother. That's not fair. And he moved the bed to the tent of Leah. And Jacob didn't like it. Don't interfere in my business. And it was considered a big thing for, for Reuven. Then here, many years later, 200 years later, um, Moses is praying, may Reuven live and not die in the world to come. He should be forgiven for the sin and should continue to live, so to speak. As he says on page 40 in the Rashi itself, as the incidents of Bila, in the Rashi, not in the little commentary. Oh, oh. As the incidents of Bila will not be reckoned against him. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And he should be a part of the 12 tribes. That's what he had to say for Reuven. Now we'll continue <coughs> next verse about Jacob. 
But About we, Judah. We'll before, before we get there real quickly, are these blessings for the individual or for the tribes or for both? For the tribes, for the tribes, the both. That's everything. The tribes defend the individual. That's what he says here. If, they, if he will not be lost, that the tribe will not be lost. He goes together. But it was more for the tribe. But it has to do with, uh, the, with Reuven's story. If you're the father of the tribe, everything that you do affects the whole tribe. How do we reconcile what happened with the, the ten northern tribes that became, you know, conquered, you know, obviously mm -hmm. hundreds of years after mm -hmm. this, but mm -hmm. uh, how, mm -hmm. how do we reconcile these prophecies then? I mean, at some point, they all stop, or most of them do. Not all. Yeah. Judah is continued. Judah, obviously, and Benjamin. And, Levi. Uh, Levi, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the but, rest but the of rest them, of them, like Reuben, has gone. So after and, all, <laughs> yeah, we have, we have a free choice. What happened to them? They assimilated. That's the bottom line. They assimilated. But still blessed? They are lost tribes. What do you mean lost? They got lost. <laughs> <laughs> they got assimilated. Simple as that. Later we went after the second destruction of the second temple. The Jewish people went in exile. They did not assimilate. The people went and after, in before the, the destruction of the first temple, the, the, the exile of the ten tribes just got lost. Because in Israel they were lost already. They were idol worshippers in Israel for so many years. They did not have a strong Jewish identity. They got lost. That's, that's what happened. How is this with the prayers? I mean, even they survived for so many generations. And you need to understand, there is remnants of all the tribes among the tribes of us. In general, in big, in bulk, they were... They are lost, the ten tribes. But I'm sure that there is a few of the tribe of Reuven and a few of the tribe of Shimon who are as in, uh, in immersed into, into the tribe of Judah and Benjamin and Levi. We are, in general, we can say we are, we are a continuation of tribe of Judah and Benjamin. But to, even during the, the two kingdoms, right, still Jews escaped from the kingdom of the ten tribes and went to Jews, the more religious Jews, run away to the kingdom of Judah and joined, and joined the Judean kingdom. And even after the exile of the ten tribes, there were still leftovers who joined the kingdom of Judah. And it's not everybody is gone. The, the blessing is for the people of state. Now we go to page 40, number 7. We talk about uh, Judah. Now, oh, right. <laughs> Now this is for Yehuda, and he said, I do not hear the voice of Yehuda, and bring him to his people. May his hands fight battles, and may he provide assistance against the enemies. What is this? What is he talking about? Judah, as Rashi says, Judah, you remember the story with Judah when he had to take Benjamin? He told, they came to Joseph. Joseph was the ruler of Egypt. He told Joseph, Joseph told them, I will not believe that you are not uh, um, spies until you don't bring Benjamin down. He comes on, and Jacob tells him, you took Joseph, he disappeared. Next time you took Shimon, he disappeared too. You guys, every dip you take, somebody is coming. One, one less. What's going on here? I'm not giving you Benjamin. Finally, there was no choice. Judah told them, give me Benjamin. I promise you'll bring you back. And if not, I will be sinning to you forever. And because he said it, it's not that I was cynic to you, it was still had an effect, even if he brought Benjamin back. So now, something interesting to note, did he really bring Benjamin back or not? Yes, yes. Yeah. What do you mean, yeah? Eventually. It says he brought him back. It doesn't say. It doesn't say? Well, no. he vouched for him. He vouched so for him. So in a sense, he got him back. <laughs> He and he, back, he says they went back, right? According to many commentators, Joseph kept Benjamin in Egypt, and he wanted to make sure it's Jacob is coming. The whole big argument, if Benjamin came back, or Benjamin didn't come back. <coughs> then according to this part, Judah never fulfilled his promise, I think. I mean, nothing happened to Benjamin, don't get me wrong, but he actually didn't bring him back. Is there a connection between this and, and the three sons uh, of Judah, where he, he loses the first one in Leverite marriage to Tamar, loses the second one, won't, won't allow the third one? Is there a parallel there? Or? You say something, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More than something. I never thought about that, but yes, I'm sure there is something there, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. After it happened to him, he understood what happened to his father. 
he was able to be in his father's shoes and to understand what his father is going through. That's why by Benjamin, he said, I will bring it back, no matter what. I never thought about that, but you say something. I'm sure somebody says something like this. In this story, there is so many commentators and so many commentaries that basically his, his, his bones were rolling in, the, in, his, in his coffin and not intact. Look, look what Rashi says. Rashi on page 430, in addition, the rabbis explain. It's right here in the bottom. It's like five, six times from the bottom. You see, in addition, the rabbis explain throughout the four years. In addition, the rabbis explained that throughout the 40 years that the Israelites were in the wilderness, Yehuda's bones rolled about in his coffin because of the banishment which he accepted upon himself. As it is said, continue the Rashi on next page, 431. As it is said, I have sinned against my father for all time. Okay, that's what happened. Look the note, the small, small note in the small printing in number 41. When the Israelite left Egypt. Hmm. When the Israelites left Egypt, they carried the bones of the 12 tribal fathers with them for burial <coughs> in Eretz Israel. The others were at peace, but Yehuda's bones were destroyed. <coughs> According to the Talmud, not only Joseph was taken to Israel. All the 12 sons of Jacob were taken to Israel. And there is uh, places in Israel that said this is the cave of Reuben, this is the cave of this. And, and it, t it was 12 coffins, basically. It was a whole parade. Um, and all the other bones were intact. And Judah's bones were not intact. Would that be customary to go look inside the coffin? No, it's not customary. So how would they... You, even if you carry it, you can... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Rattling around. <laughs> and this, that you don't look in the coffin, is more a tradition that later started. But then, the but then I thought that the uh, Sadiqiums don't really that's, decay. That, that's what I'm saying. They didn't decay, but it was disjoint because wow. he took upon himself this, this decree. And, and then Moshe Rabbeinu was praying to him, he should, he should find peace, basically. In a simple word, he should find peace. That's the story with Judah. Now we'll continue on page 432 to Levi. And regarding Levi, he said, your Tumim and your Urim to your pious man. Let's stop right there. Your Tumim and your Urim. What's, Uri what's Tumim and Urim? So your breastplate. That was Urim and Tumim is the breastplate that the high priest used to wear. There is the breastplate. Inside the breastplate, there was a, the name oh. of God and a piece of parchment. And that caused that the breastplate could be operated. What means could be operated? When the high priest used to stand in front of the ark and he asked a question of, to God in his mind, let's say you go to war, should not go, certain letters, what was the breastplate? Twelve stones, and every stone was engraved one of the names of the sons of the Jacob, the twelve tribes. Then when he, he asked a question, certain letters would light up, and these letters would give him, if he arranged them correctly, he understood the answer. Let's say, should I go to war? Let's say, say Hashem answers, can. Half and noon would be a letter. There's a famous story, we mentioned it a few times, about one of the commentaries about Hannah. Hannah mm -hmm. went into the temple, and she prayed to God, and Eli thought that she's drunk. Why she thought she was drunk? He asked Hashem, what's the lady? And he saw letters, half shin, reishay. That if you arrange it, it could be shikora, drunk, or kshera. Kshera means kosher, righteous. That Hashem tells them she's kshera, but he made the wrong mistake, shikora. It means to say, even when Hashem gives you a message, if you don't have the muzzle, you interpret that your message is wrong. People say, oh, I understand the message from God. Even to be understanding a message from God, you have to be a maven. Not everyone can translate a message from God. Very really? important for people to know that. Oh, I saw it as a message you got. Hey, Habzachnisht. Who says that you understood the message? Because <laughs> once a guy came to the Rebbe, he had like seven uh, uh, places still to go to be a Chabad rabbi. And then he says, before he walked in, somebody else offered them. He tells the Rebbe, because it was the last thing, that was a divine providence that I have to go there. The Rebbe told him, that the story goes, since when you became a maven in divine providence. <laughs> 
Understand? Even to understand the message from God, you have to have a blessing. What do you want to say? I was going to ask, were there other examples other than the story of Hannah where they got the message mixed up? Or? Yes, I mean, um, yeah, King David, no, mixed up, I don't know, but King David asked from uh, the whole story that with Saul and the Nov in Iraq, and the Doeg, and the whole story there, he asked from a coin what to do, and the coin got all asked for him for God, and that's why Saul was angry with the high priest. That's a whole story. But that's a different story. In any case, the Urim the Tumim, Today is being used in a modern world. Some place is using it in their logo. You know that? Some university is looking in the logo. Use that? Yale <laughs> in their logo. It's written in Hebrew. Urim v'tumim. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Wow! I just I saw that in my daughter's sweatshirt that she brought me. Yeah. I was noticing the Hebrew. I remember to learn with a boy <laughs> who went to Yale. He bought me the sweatshirt. I look at it. What is this doing here? I researched that. They, they were, well, obviously, the people who established Yale wanted that the place should be what's the limit to him? Gives all the answers. The light for the people and completes all, every question you get answers from the Urim Tumim. They wanted Yale University should be the Urim Tumim of America. When we want to say about a great rabbi that everybody asked this question by him, they say he was the Urim Tumim. He was there. He had all the answers. Then he says, the Urim Tumim should be to your pious men, to the, 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 to the high priest. Continue. Whom you tried with tests, you brought him strife at the waters of Mariva. That's, he speaks about who he tried with tests. He speaks about Levi. Who came out from Levi? Moses and Aaron. And they were tried with the test with the water of Mariva. They were at they were the story with the water. They, they eat the rock instead of speaking to the rock. Then he continues on page, on page 433, number 9. He who said of his father and his mother, I did not see them, and his brothers he did not recognize, and his sons he did not know. Continue. For they observed your command and kept your covenant. Okay, we'll stop right there. They observed your command and kept your covenant. Unbelievable what Rashi says about kept your covenant. The covenant of circumcision. Go ahead, read the Rashi on page 434. For of those born in the wilderness, the Israelites did not circumcise their children. You hear what's going on? In the, world, in, the, in the desert for 40 years, the Jews did not circumcise their kids. Why? Azoi, why? There is a few explanations. One explanation is that the, that the blood did not clot. The ear in the desert was such that they couldn't, it was out for the blood to get to, to be clotted. Therefore, that's one explanation. Another explanation is, in the desert, you never knew when you live, right? It was up to the cloud of glory. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine in the middle of the breeze, the cloud of glory is moving, you cannot move with the baby, or just a minute you go ahead <coughs> the breeze. That means you will be left by yourself in the desert and the whole nation will move. How are you going to, are you going to survive? Anybody ever see the Seinfeld episode where in the, they, they were there in their Mercedes and the Moyles in the back and then yeah, driving yeah. along and right. bumping they up were, and down? They were stationary for a long time <laughs> in a few, a few places. But they didn't know. Ah. Right? Okay, fair enough. Nobody knew a minute later where it's going to be. Later, they know that they were 18 years in one place. But at the moment, it could be in a moment they're moving. There were some places they were only for one night, some places for one day. That they didn't circumcise. That first of all, in Egypt, we, only the tribe of the Levites circumcised. In Egypt, it's understood. The rest of the Jews were more, more plainly assimilated. They were, didn't have a Jewish education. They didn't know about the priests. But in the desert, they were not circumcised. But the Levites were circumcised. What? What? The Levites were circumcised. The Levites. The Levites. Yeah, yeah. The Levites were circumcised. Yes. The, the Levites... Still did it, even it was a risk. Even it was a risk. The Levites were the Hasidic Jews. They said we have to circumcise the, the children no matter what, and Hashem will help us. And we, you know, when Joshua, before he entered the land of Israel, he ordered the whole Jewish nation, 600,000 men circumcised in one day. It was piles and piles of blood. Oh, you think what was going on there? They circumcised, but the, that he says, that's what he says. They, they kept you covenant, the tribe of the Levites, in Egypt and in the desert, no matter what, circumcise the children, fulfill the Brit Mitzvah, Brit Milah. 
like you know, like in Russia, some Jews, most of the Jews did not have moils, they didn't do circumcision. But there were still moils available in Russia. In the worst times, they were moils around. If you wanted to, you could find a moil. You risked your life. Miriam's great grandfather was a moil. He was arrested and shot and ki killed because he made reason. But I, I was born in Russia. There was a moil in Russia. And he did circumcision. And it's interesting. You know, the Rebbe did not want that the people who are, who are moils and rabbis and shoichets should leave Russia. But he couldn't tell them, don't go. I mean, but you see, people who were moils in Russia and were big machas, they came to Israel, only the moils from Russia and Jerusalem. Coming to Jerusalem, there is much more professional moils and much more everything in Jerusalem. I mean, you who doesn't speak the language, you don't know the new te techniques, he came from Russia. This Jew was my moil, was a very good Jew in Russia, he was flourishing. He came to Israel, he was sitting at home, nobody needed him, nobody, nothing. Mm -hmm. It means to say, when you have a mission in life, don't run away. Do what Hashem wants from you. It'll be good for you too, not just for Hashem. Then did what the Levites. Now he says in number 10, you want to continue? Page 434, number 10, in the text. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They shall. Mm -hmm. okay. They shall teach your law to Yaakov and your Torah to Yisrael. Let them place incest before you, and totally consumed offerings on your altar. Okay, you know what the job of the Levites? To teach Torah to Jacob, your laws to Jacob, and your Torah to Israel. The job of the Levites was to be the rabbis, not to offer sacrifices. That was, you know, a regular Kohen, you know how often it was in the temple? There were 24 groups. Every group was a week. Basically, Every week was changing a group that twice a year, if you are part of the group, you're twice a year for a week in the temple. From the group alone, not every day you're serving. You serve a day. But two days a year you were in the temple. What you did the rest of the time, the coin of the Levites, their job was to be the teachers of the Jewish people, the spiritual leaders. In the beginning they did their job, but later they made it into a club. The Torah belongs only to them. Then God said, then basically the Torah, the job moved over to the rabbis. You know, my God, it's like this. You don't want to do my job, I'll find somebody else. <laughs> you think you're the only one in town? We're giving you an opportunity. You don't want it, fine. But that was the job of the Levites, and we say it also in the Aftoras, and the Prophet says, uh, We should ask, they should ask uh, uh, the Torah from the Kohen. That's what the Prophet says. Torah now he says, then he says, let them place the incense before you. The coin's job was to put incense, right? And what it's written right in number 11, after he, somebody puts incense, Hashem bless his wealth. Hashem bless his wealth and accept his handiwork. Okay, let's stop right here. The Talmud says, any coin was offering incense, Hashem blessed his wealth. He became rich. Therefore, they never gave the same coin to offer incense twice. They wanted more coin to have opportunity. And they used to make a raffle from all the coins who never had a chance to offer incense. And they raffled out, and one of them was offering incense. And because it's written that Hashem will bless them. What's today considered like offering incense? Prayer. To be a sandek by a breeze. To all the baby by the circumcision is considered like offering incense because it's like almost like a sacrifice. It's considered a very, very special thing. And anybody who is a Sandek has the merit to become rich. That's why many people want to be Sandeks. In the religious community, they will pay you for the breeze and a little more if you let them to be the Sandek. And then it's, I mean, not everybody is a Sandek becomes rich and selling with money, rich with muscle, rich with good family, good children, health. There is many richness in the world, but it's a big blessing. And then he say, shatter his adversaries at the loin. Shatter his adversaries at the loins and his enemies so that, so that they may not arise. Okay. Now we'll go to the blessing of Benjamin. Regarding Benjamin. 
He said, Hashem's friend, let him live secure with him. He hovers protectively over him throughout the day, and he resides between his shoulders. He resides between his shoulders. It means that the, the only temple will be at the parts of Benjamin. The land of Benjamin, the holy temple itself, the temple mount, where the holy of holies was there, I think, is in part of Benjamin. Then Hashem, that's a blessing, that Hashem will reside by Benjamin. Let's continue on page 437. What's the blessing for Joseph? And regarding Joseph, he said, Blessed by Hashem is his land, with the delight of heaven from dew and the deep waters that lie below, with the delight of the sun's harvest and with the delight of the moon ripening, with the first fruits of the early mountains and from the sweetness of the perennial hills and from the sweetness of the earth in its fullness, in the favor of the one who resides in the thorn bush, let this be visited upon Yosef's head and upon the head of the one set apart from his brothers. See, here is set apart from his brothers in Nebu. What's written in Nebu? Nazir Echav. What's a Nazir? A Nazirite. Yeah, like Samson. Like Samson. Yeah. Nazarite. According to some opinion, Joseph was a Nazarite too. He didn't, didn't cut his ear, right? He had beautiful ear with the story with Potiphar's wife. He didn't cut his ear. Nazir Echav. He was a, he was a Nazarite. But according to some commentaries, some opinion, that he was also a Nazarite. Okay. But literally it means he was separated from the brothers because he sold them. A lot of blessings too. You're right. He gets a lot of blessings. No pain, no gain, right? He suffered more, he got more blessings. Yeah. Joseph's here, I saw him, I remember. Is it was long? <laughs> <laughs> Is it was long? Yeah. He had beautiful ear, absolutely. Continue. His firstborn ox, yeah. glory to him, and ram's horns are his horns, which, with which he will bore together peoples to the ends of the earth, and they are Ephraim's myriads, and they are Menashe's thousands. Basically, it's all prophecy of the future of Ephraim and Menashe, how they will win the wars, and they will accomplish. Moses was a prophetic, a prophesied of the future of all the tribes, and that's what he was talking about. Now we are coming to Zebulun and Issachar. Okay, page 440. And regarding Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, at your departure, and Yisachar in your tent. Let's stop right here. Oh, 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 oh. Who is older, Zebulun or Yisachar? Mm -hmm. It's got to be Yisachar. You see, by the question, you understood that. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Sheilat Chacham, Chatsi Tshuva. A question, a smart question is I have an answer, you already get the answer. Issachar is older than Zebulon. Then Moses should mention Issachar before Zebulon. It's not fair, I would be insulted already. And especially Issachar and Zebulon are the children of the same uh, mother, right? Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> then, it's, but it's the same thing with the prime and Menashe above. You write the fine and Menashe, we know the story. Cousin Mo Jacob switched his hand, and you already, we already don't get angry. We're already used to it. We know from, from if Jacob said it to Mo Moses, it will sure follow his footsteps. But why is Zebulun before Issachar? Rashi says something amazing. On page 441, the second Rashi, Rejoice Zebulun at your departure, and Issachar in your tent. What is Rashi saying? Go ahead, Mark. Who is so you? Me? Okay. Oh. Huh? Uh, Zebulon and Isgar entered into partnership. Zebulon shall reside at the sea coast. He uh, parts to engage in maritime trade, gain profit, and provide sustenance for Issachar, while they remain occupied with tourist study. Okay, okay, okay. Let's stop right here. There is a partnership was between Zebulon and Issachar. Zebulon were the businessmen. And Issachar was scholars. They were the, the head of the Sanhedrin. They were the scholars. They were the teachers. They were the scribes. And they made a partnership that Zebulun will support Issachar 
and Issachar Stora will go on the reward, will go on the account of Zebulun too. Then that's what he says, and provide sustenance for Issachar. While continue this, while they remained well, occupied with the Torah study. Go ahead. While they remained occupied with Torah studies, Zebulun therefore proceeds Yisachar as Yisachar's Torah was made possible by uh, Zebulun. Then Moses says, Zebulun comes before Issachar. Because if not for, Is for Zebulun, Issachar wouldn't could be such a big rabbi, right? Because Zebulun supports him. That the supporter of the Torah comes before the Torah, the Torah study. Isn't this one of the verses that supported, uh, you know, kind of the Zionism in modern Israel, that the, you know, the businessmen, you know, the, the secular Jews are supporting the, the uh, you know, academic study, and so that's good? <laughs> then, then I'll tell you, this is not only in Israel. That's a partnership that goes on for 3,000 years. Since Zebul and Issachar was always the people who learned Torah, and they were the businessmen who supported the yeshivas, and that's how this partnership worked always. But here we say, Zebul comes before Issachar. Now I'll tell you a story. I was a Jew in, in a city in Poland. Which city? Have it some. City's name is Ternov in Galicia. Here is Galicia. It's uh, Poland. Ukraine. Poland. By Ukraine, Ukraine, yeah. Right? Yeah. Ternov is the city. Ukraine. Was a, na a Jew with the name of Vadia. The Katsev. You know what a Katsev is? Katsev is the butcher. Vadia the butcher, very simple Jew, but a very righteous man. He didn't know a lot. All they used to say psalms and pray in every free moment. Once he walked on the street, he sat down on a bench to rest. Said to him, next time, next time, sat down a young man, a modern Jew, was laughing on all the old stories. And started to mock him. Oh, he's saying psalms, who needs that? And then he said, I would sell my heaven for 10, 10 pennies, 10 groschens. This Ovadia took out 10 groschens. I'm okay, I'm buying it. Done. A short time later, this young man somewhere, wherever he was, got sick and died. Then, one day, a woman shows up in Beslin, in Ternov, and she says, I'm the wife of the person who just died, and he came to me in the dream, and he told me a story that before he died, he sold his merit to another Jew of his heaven, and he's in big trouble there because of this. And he wants her to go and to buy back the, the right. And he told her, who's the person? She never heard the story before. She, didn't heard from, she never heard of the incident. The rabbi looked at her and said, don't worry, it's dreams, nonsense. Go, go, go home. Lady, go home. The next day she comes, she says, he came to me. He wanted to choke me. He says, I cannot survive here. Go to the rabbi. And the woman was a strong woman. She started to make noise and tumult and tumult. The rabbis couldn't refuse them. That they set up a special baby and they got the greatest rabbis in, in Galicia to, to do something about it. What's going on? You can imagine such a story. The baby was not in the little room where they usually convert. It was in the biggest synagogue in town. Thousands of people came to see what's going to be there. Ovadia, this Ovadia, the, the butcher, had a few sons. His sons were not so holy as his. They told him, Father, now is your opportunity once for a lifetime. They wanted to buy it back, make the community pay you 100,000 zlotes. It was a huge amount of money. I got $100,000. $10,000, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And Novadia said, whatever the holy rabbis will say, that's what I'm going to do. He didn't listen to his sons who were trying to make a deal there. <laughs> trying to make money on the story. And the whole shul is packed with people, and Novadia was a sick man, he couldn't even stay in shul. Finally, they hear, Novadia, the rabbis are calling you. They took him in from the window, and they carried him over the people. They were so packed up, he couldn't step down. I know what means to speak like this. In San Vicente, it was to be packed, you, couldn't, you had to walk over people, you couldn't walk on the floor, no such thing. The rabbis started their own negotiation. They came with the conclusion that nobody can sell the Isolam Abba. No such thing as selling your heaven. No such thing. What is this man coming in dream? This is a punishment for him not appreciating his Isolam Abba, then he's being driven crazy a little bit in heaven. But this alone, that this story awakens so many Jews to appreciate their heaven and to become more, more observant, this will be a merit for him for 
for Olam Abba, he should find rest. The question is, how, how could he come to this conclusion? We learn here that you can make a deal. What means they say you cannot sell your mitzvahs? Here it is. Zebulun and Issachar made a partnership. I will learn Torah and half of the merit of my Torah will go to you. You will give me money and I will, I will benefit from your money and half of my Torah go to you. We can make a bargain. How did the rabbi say in terms of, they also knew this Rashi, I can promise you. Then you cannot, there is no, you cannot sell your mitzvahs. What is this? Here we see you can sell your mitzvahs. The answer is, depends when. There is a story about Hillel, the famous Hillel, the great rabbi Hillel. Hillel came, made Aliyah from, from uh, Babylon. He was an Iraqi Jew. The Babylonian Jews in Israel were treated as second-class citizens. He was very poor. In that time, they used to, all, he used to pay tuition on a daily basis. You want to come to the yeshiva? Pay. It's like you're going into the underboss. Pay. But Hillel used to go half a day to work to make a living. And the other day, half a day, he used to come and pay. With this money, he paid to go into the, into the school. It's a famous story. One day he couldn't find the wall. He went on the mm -hmm. roof. He listened to the Torah. He was frozen. Mm -hmm. He almost died. They saved him on Shabbat. They said he's wanted to violate the whole Shabbos for this Jew. And Hillel became famous and, and fa very famous. He had a brother. His brother's name was, I forgot his name, I think Shabnan. What was his father's, father's name? Um, Shabna, yeah, Shabna, I was right. <laughs> Shabna was his name, was a very rich man. And Shabna saw that Hillel became the leader of the Jewish people. He comes to Hillel and he tells him, let's make a deal. I'll give you half of my estate. And you give me half of your merit, of your Torah. You learned so much Torah, you did so many mitzvahs. Hillel the older, there is nobody in Jewish history almost as big as Hillel. And as famous, even non-Jews know about Hillel. Very, they know about the very few rabbis are famous in the world. Hillel is my man in this, Hillel and the Rebbe. <laughs> Who else is known? In the, in the, Rabbi Akiva is not famous in the gentle world. I no. don't think you, when you meet a Krishna, you know who Rabbi Akiva is. Hillel, he knows. Rabbi Akiva, he doesn't know. There is a story about Hillel, in the, in, I read in the regular newspaper, the children's stories, mm, this I remember so long time, so one of these newspapers was a story about Hillel. I never saw the story about Rabbi Akiva. In any case, then came out a voice from heaven and said, somebody will sell his Torah. Um, they quoted a verse from, from, from the Song of Song. If a person will give... Uh, the, all the money of, of, for, for, the, for the love of Torah, it will be a shame, like, so to speak, you cannot sell your Torah. Then basically, Hillel didn't sell the Torah, and he couldn't sell the Torah. Then what's the explanation? Depends when. Before you start to learn Torah, we can make a partnership. And we can say the Torah that I will study will go on your merit, yes. If you support the other person, after I learned Torah, after I did a mitzvah to sell it later, then it's too late. Like an investment. Or after you become Bill Gates, oh, I want to be your partner, Shekoyach, Shalom Aleichem, now we don't need you. <laughs> when, we, when you offer the, the stocks and it was worth it one dollar and we were collecting money, collecting partners, yeah, everybody's invited. Everybody can invest. Later, now you're a chochem, and Hillel is Hillel, now you're going to be his partner? Absolutely not. And that's a different the story with Zebulun and Issachar, and the story with Hillel and Shabna, his brother. Shabna came after the story, when Hillel became, so to speak, rich with Torah. When the, when the business is already big, the, the company is huge, and every stock is a million dollars. We don't need you there. Do you want? You have to pay. Who knows how much? I cannot sell a mitzvah that was done. It's already done, you understand? The merit is there. Before that, if you are becoming an helper to accomplish a mitzvah, then you, your merit is forever. And what's the lesson? The lesson is it's not over. Every time there is another mitzvah to be done, we can become partners. You understand? It's not like people say, oh, if I wish I would be here before they build the shul, I would, I would be a partner. There is always a continuation that's going on. <laughs> then don't worry, there is always opportunities. <laughs> but that's what he's saying here. <laughs> And that's what the story with Zebulon and Issachar. Mm -hmm. Now we'll continue on page 442. 
number 19. Peoples shall assemble at the mountain. There they will slaughter righteous offerings, for by the streaming of the sea they shall be nurtured, and the hidden treasures of sand. Okay, um, that's a little, um, you need you see there's a lot of Rashi for this. Mm -hmm. But one of the meaning is that um, in, the, in the places in their, in their um, look on the Rashi on page 442, the last Rashi, in the hidden treasures of sand. Continue, read it. Concealed, immersed in the sands, tuna, the chilazon fish. The chilazon fish. The blue dye. Okay. The blue dye. The chilazon fish. You know that he used to be in the time of the te of of the ta the temple and a little after. In the Torah, it's written. We say in the Shema that one thread has to be blue of the tzitzis. One thread has to be a blue thread. And that was made. How they made the blue the dye? That was a special fish. It's called the chilazon. And from this fish was inside a certain type of um, pigment. Whatever right. it was, like liquid, that from this they can make dye, blue dye. And the chilazon fish, even then, was a very precious thing, and that gave the bottom a lot of business. And there is going on for a hundred years an argument to renew the chilazon fish, to renew the trailer. It's called trailer. To renew the blue thread. What was the purpose of the blue thread? The blue thread was. And the Talmud says two explanations. One explanation is the blue thread was reminding us of the color of the blue of the sea. The sea is a reflection of the sky, right? The sky is blue. The water, you look at the water, it's blue. That the blood of the sea is a reflection of the sky, and the sky reminds us about God. Then the blue thread in the city is supposed to remind us about Hashem. That's why it's blue. The second explanation is that the blue reminds us of something called blue. What else was blue? Something the very tablets. important. Very good. Yeah. The tablets were sapphire stone. Sapphire is blue. Then the blue of the cities reminds us about the, the blue of the Ten Commandments, of the two tablets. And what happened the last hundred years? What the bottom line is for so two thousand years we did not have the Hilazon. Two thousand, fifteen hundred years, the argument, eleven hundred years, twelve hundred years. The bottom line is we don't have it. Then came a rabbi 100 years ago, and he, dis and he argued that he found the chilazon. He found the fish. Now, how we know it's a fish? Usually, everything they do, like etrog, how you know that etrog is etrog? From tradition. My father took from this etrog tree, my grandfather took the etrog tree, my great grandfather took the etrog tree. That's how I know. Chilazon, uh, that's a chilazon fish. And it became a whole argument, and he wrote many books, and he was. Uh, uh, most of the world did not accept the chilazon fish. One of the explanations is because blue, the Kabbalistic explanation, besides many other explanations, the Ariza said that the, the blue color will come when Moshiach comes, or we'll return together with Moshiach. Why, why we don't want the blue, white represents chesed, kindness. Blue represents gvura, judgment. Are we looking for more judgment? We want chesed and chesed and chesed that we spoke Shabbos about. Then we say in the, in the 13 attributes of mercy, we say Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachom Vechanon. The name Hashem, Yud, Kei, Vav, Kei, the four letters of the name of God, represents kindness, chesed. The name Elohim represents strictness, judgment, discipline, gvura. Therefore, we never find in the Bible or in the prayer book, Elohim, Elohim, twice Elohim, because you don't want a double portion of, 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 uh, of judgment. Even one portion is also too much. Hashem, Hashem, sure. Double portion of kindness, absolutely. That's how we pray to God, He should forgive us. He should give us a double portion of kindness. Then that's what it's all about. And this chilazon, I, I was just in Israel, so I joined the shul, it goes with, uh, with, with chilas. I told him, first of all, the chilas that he has is light blue. Chilas, what Rashi said, what the Bible said meant, is dark blue. It's almost, it's navy blue, it's almost black. Because Rashi says, in a few places in the Talmud and in the Bible, it has to be as dark as when the night is dark. When the night comes, when the night is dark, it's not blue, it's black. I told them, first of all, 
this is not the blue, that's not the black that you see in the dark. <laughs> and then I told them, you need more judgment, you need more gvura. And this guy is plenty of gvura. <laughs> and we should only have chesed.